Uh, we are delighted to see such a full room. Uh, I should begin, however, by apologizing to anyone who would like to have filled the room further and was unable to get in. Because of the events in Boston, um, security had to be tightened earlier than we expected at the meetings. And we know some people may not have been able to access the building for which we apologize. But I believe this is being filmed, and so we'll make sure it's available to everybody who wish to attend. And we consider you here in spirit. Um, we also have to announce a late minute uh, change, which is that our colleagues from Tanzania um, were called away to an urgent matter, and so will not be joining us in the panel, but they too are here in spirit. We thank all of you for being here, and uh, since we have only an hour, we will get right into it. Um, I want to welcome all of you for coming, and I want to acknowledge immediately um, our co hosts of today's event, which are the governments of Canada and Ireland who have both been two stalwart leaders and very effective champions uh, for improved nutrition overall and for the role of agriculture in particular. And they've also been very active donor partners in the Sun Movement, in which the bank is a proud partner. And this movement alone has already helped to draw um, dramatic, more concerted international attention to the importance of the first thousand days um, to every person's life, and particularly those in developing countries. Um, I think everyone in here is convinced that nutrition is a crucial building block for development, both of the individual and the communities, and ultimately of nations. We know how much it leads to cognitive capacity and correlates with all sorts of uh, later life outcomes, such as earnings capacity and productivity and so forth. And we often frame this in the negative, which is that if a child is undernourished or misses this opportunity, it's lost forever. I always choose to frame this instead in positive terms, which is if we catch the opportunity, this is truly a magic bullet, once in a lifetime investment that lasts forever. Many development investments, um, frankly, have very high upkeep costs. Roads need to be built, rebuilt every three years, no matter how high the standard is. Industries can lose comparative advantage and go bankrupt and disappear. A child who grows four centimeters is never going to shrink four centimeters. She's never going to lose the cognitive capacity that she built up at the right time in her life, and that will carry her all the way through the rest of her years. So not only are these very high return investments, probably the highest in all of development, uh, but they are also extremely robust to anything that life can throw at them. Um, of course, we know that effectively addressing malnutrition requires a number of measures, which is one reason it is such a challenge. Um, we need, of course, exclusive breastfeeding. We need proper prenatal care good disease management early in life, micronutrients, a host of other things. Um, but we also need the contributions that agriculture and other sectors can make. And that's really our focus today, which is why we're very happy to have colleagues from um, a wide variety of agencies, including my colleague from the agricultural side of the World Bank. And we're going to hear from these distinguished co-hosts and panelists um, about what it's going to take to leverage improvements in nutrition through agriculture. Um, where our operational knowledge gaps still exist, what we can do about them individually, and most important, collectively, uh, what it is that we need to do in order to reach the most vulnerable members um, of the countries that we are all trying to serve. So first, let me introduce uh, my co-hosts very briefly, and with apologies to everyone, in light of the tight time, I'm going to dispense with the lengthy biographies, which are available on the web. Um, you came here to hear the things you can't see on the web. So. Um, first, the Honorable Julian Fantino, who is Canada's Minister of International Cooperation and the Member of Parliament for Vaughan. Um, he previously served as Associate Minister of Defense and Minister of State for Seniors. He um, was first elected to the House of Commons in November 2010 and re-elected in May 2011. So we thank him very much and his government for the support uh, in being here. And Minister Joe Costello, TD, who was first elected to the Irish Senate uh, Irish Parliament in 1989, and then um, served until 92, and then was elected to the Irish House, and has been in one body or the other ever since then. Both of them have uh, received numerous awards and accolades for their work, um, and remain very effective champions and very good partners for the World Bank in our efforts, uh, as well as holding our feet to the fire for what we do. So, uh, without further ado, I'm going to sit, and we will all remain seated for the rest of the day to keep this a bit more conversational. And I will turn to our honored guests to uh, give some discussion on two questions which I will put to them. They'll each have one question in each round, and if we are very efficient, we may have time to take one or two interventions from the floor. Um, and if not, uh, we will benefit from their wisdom. Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, I'm Julian Fantino. I'm not Joe Costello. <laughs> <laughs> but we seem 
seem to share some DNA way back when. Uh, in any event, uh, I want to start by thanking all of you for your attendance here. I'd especially like to thank Mr. Costello, Ireland's Minister of State for Trade and Development, for co-hosting this very important event, actually. And uh, Canada and Ireland share a common goal, and we share many other things, including values and so forth. But we want to find ways to stop the devastating and irreversible consequences of uh, undernutrition uh, child development. And to that end, uh, I, we also want to increase the economic potential of countries. Nutrition is one of the best investments a country can make. Investing in nutrition can increase income and educational achievements and help children and youth reach their full potential. The Scaling Up Nutrition movement represents an unprecedented opportunity for us. It allows us to work better together and support country efforts to accelerate action on nutrition. It also ensures we have a clear focus on accountability and results. Canada has been a very major player in this particular role in the Scaling Up Nutrition movement. And we made the food and nutrition key priorities for our international development assistance. We know that they are important pathways that can help lift the most vulnerable out of poverty. To maximize impact, we need to better leverage our investments in other sectors, particularly agriculture. Agriculture can transform economies and improve lives, but our investments in agriculture won't automatically improve nutrition for the most vulnerable, and we must be deliberate in our efforts. We must ensure nutrition is at the heart of our investments in agriculture. We should work to drive innovation and mobilizing new and, and innovative ways, including private sector. Lastly, we should work to improve our global understanding about what works, and Canada has taken action in all three of these areas. Canada is supporting our multilateral partners to include nutrition in their particular work, including in, in agricultural initiatives. For example, Canada is working with the International Fund for Agricultural Development. They are an important partner on our panel here today and, of course, are helping to incorporate nutrition into their strategic objectives going forward. Innovation can help energize our efforts to reduce hunger and undernutrition. For example, increasing yields among smallholder farmers, particularly women, is important. The work that Canada and other donors are doing with the World Bank to implement uh, AG results is an example of our efforts to support innovation. AG results uh, aim to stimulate private sector investment, agricultural research to improve food security in developing countries. We are finding ways to leverage these kinds of initiatives that better engage the private sector, such as the Global Agriculture and Food Security Program, through its public and private sector windows. The Global Agriculture and Food Security Program is raising agricultural productivity. It also links farmers to markets, expanding livelihood opportunities and reducing vulnerable to the vulnerability to undernutrition. And today close to $1.3 billion, $1 billion has been mobilized, including $250 million in Canadian contributions. We must continue to find ways to ensure this mechanism is sensitive to nutrition. And finally, folks, uh, we need to improve our knowledge about what works and our ability to measure the impact of our efforts. Improving our ability to measure the impact that our agricultural investments have on nutrition can enhance accountability. It lets us know if we are doing the right things. Canada's support to the World Health Organization to strengthen nutrition also, of course, contributes to these efforts. We recognize more needs to be done, particularly to ensure scalable solutions. Today's dialogue is a challenge to share successes and challenges, identify knowledge gaps, and highlight opportunities to make agriculture work for nutrition. We are lucky to have four esteemed and experienced panelists with us uh, to assist, and we're very fortunate indeed, and we thank you again for your presence here as very, very keen and important entities in our work in this particular area. Thank you again for your participation. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman, distinguished panel. Uh, 
um, Minister Fantino. Um, certainly, as you said, we perhaps have a little DNA there, but um, my name, even though I think it's Irish, sounds at least as Italian as Fantino does. <laughs> <laughs> Ireland and Canada share the same group in the World Bank and uh, we're delighted to be associated with them and we have a very strong relationship there. But we also have a strong relationship in, throughout the years in terms of trading, um, in terms of development, some of the same issues that we share, scaling up nutrition, strong emphasis on agriculture, strong emphasis on nutrition, strong emphasis on hunger, very much at the core of what we regard as the, the core issue of Irish aid and uh, we decided well, we decided for a long time but really back in 2008 um, we, we established a task force which produced what was called the Hungry Agenda Task Force and from that time onwards we decided that the central piece of our development work would always be associated with hunger and nutrition and 20% um, minimum of 20% of our development funding must go to that quarter and indeed in fact a lot more does in reality. So it's a great pleasure for me to be here to discuss this particular issue investing in agriculture and, nut and nutrition, or foreign nutrition. Uh, and earlier this week uh, we in Ireland hosted a conference in Dublin, as some of you may have heard, on hunger, nutrition and climate justice. It was clear throughout the event that more, that more can be done to improve the nutrition aspect uh, of our agricultural investment. It was also clear that this can be done in a way that protects and respects our environment and limits the risk to which the poorest on the planet are increasingly exposed. So we're very fortunate to have the support of three inspiring partners in organising the conference, the Mary Robinson Foundation, the Climate, Climate Justice, the World Food Programme, the Climate and Food Security Programme, of the consultative group on the international agricultural research and then uh, on the very last day, the very last moment, we had former President Al Gore of the United States come along to give us a rousing, uh, uh, you might say, uh, establishment of the nexus between uh, hunger, nutrition and climate change, which was, was, was good. But the dialogue over the two days was inspirational and innovative and it reminded us of a number of things. Firstly, that people need knowledge in order to anticipate plan for, respond to, and recover from shocks and exposure to risk. That we develop better policies and catalyze better action when we empower poor households and communities to engage in discussions and decisions around food and nutrition and climate. That the human rights instruments which we developed together almost 50 years ago are a powerful framework for ensuring that people are put before profit and the most vulnerable people are protected from hunger and from the impacts of climate change which they did not cause. That poor and vulnerable households are managing combinations of risk every day and any strategy to manage those risks should be developed with their realities in mind. Most importantly, we learned that we will not feed our growing global population in a changing climate and meet the health and care needs of our population until we do things differently. When we put people at the centre of our decisions, we are driven to think in a holistic fashion. We see global challenges as intrinsically linked, and we see how to respond more effectively to these challenges. Consulting communities affected by investment takes time and skill and effort. But it is time, skill and effort well spent as the results are better and last longer, and we certainly experienced a tremendous uh, synergy during that conference to a couple of days ago. One case study from the conference that struck me was the operational research program in Ethiopia, where farmers were able to set the research agenda and were consulted on what their needs were. They then got the advice they needed on seeds and techniques and resistant crops. The impact on their income and family nutrition was quite remarkable. And the government extension services were able to build up skills and knowledge to give advice on topics that were in demand and they effectively controlled the communities to small committees control the whole operation. Governments and businesses in countries dealing with high burdens of nutrition invest in research, infrastructure, inputs, markets, labor, and technology. To have the maximum impact, those investments can and should seek to leverage improved nutrition. Better nourished populations are more productive, they work better, they innovate, they earn more, and they invest more. 
They are the future producers and consumers. <coughs> it is estimated that hunger constrains economic growth by between 3 and 9% of GDP. Nutrition is truly a growing agenda. Our failure to su sufficiently address physical growth affects economic growth. Nutrition is not achieved with adequate food alone. It also requires health and child care. However, food is an essential requirement for nutrition security, and so agricultural investments and agricultural policies which promote nutrition are critical. As a supplier of food, a source of income, and an engine of growth, agriculture has the potential to significantly and sustainably improve the poor people's nutrition and health. In this room today, we represent a significant proportion of investment in agriculture and rural infrastructure. We are all investors, in one way or another, and we must all ensure that our investments deliver best returns for our families, our communities and our countries. The World Bank has made great strides over recent years in linking their loans and grants to better outcomes for poor people. They have developed best practice in what works and how to test the longer term sustainability of an investment. There is more to be done in this area, but I encourage the bank to continue on this path and to continue with their commitment to integrate poverty and nutrition into all agricultural programs. And we were earlier this morning at a meeting on the fragile states, and this is a key area which, ironically enough, despite the fact that you would imagine that fragile states are the ones that have the most hunger problems, which of course they do, but you would imagine that they would be most keen to come in on the nutrition and the scaling up nutrition agenda. In fact, they are not, because they don't have, in many, in many situations, the governance or the capacity to do so. So in fact, those that need it most very often lose out on the opportunity. Families are the best investors in agriculture. The realities and experience of food insecurity must inform national, regional and global priorities. Their priorities must find expression and be heard beyond barriers of voicelessness and exclusion. When considering agricultural investment, the effects of a changing climate on water, sanitation, disease patterns, soil fertility, fuel, health, labour and the price of nutritious food must all be at the front of our minds. Equally, the effects of agricultural choices on nutrition and climate uh, are, are, are critical. Decisions in relation to irrigation, fertilizers and land use will all affect emissions and people's access to the natural resources on which their livelihoods depend. Today is a good example of how we can start thinking differently. Together we need to identify what arguments and incentives and frameworks will encourage investment in agriculture to take into account the nutrition and value of that investment. To look at the nutrition that crops and livestock and fisheries and forestries might bring to communities to look at the impact of agricultural investment on the time women will have to cook, breastfeed and care for children, to look at where the farmers and neighbours will get fuel, water, food and health care, to look at how to keep children and girls in school and not expose them to early labour, early marriage and early pregnancy, to look at how smallholder farmers can access credit and invest in ways that make most sense for themselves and their families, to look longer term at soil fertility and water tables and land tenure and emissions future markets. We all, governments, donors, multilateral institutions, civil society, private sector and citizens need to work harder and better together to enhance our partnerships and coordinate our actions. This is critical at every level, at community, district and sub-national level, in food, in secure countries and in countries prone to food crises and climate shocks and at regional and international levels. Ireland is a staunch supporter of the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement together with Canada and many other countries. We believe that the strength of Sun is the multi-sectoral approach which it embraces. Sun provides a platform for nutrition communities in health and agriculture and social protection to see themselves as part of one solution and one movement. Sun embraces principles of partnership and accountability. It emerged out of the recognition that working together and listening to the needs of our partners, we can achieve lasting change. So I encourage you all here today to see yourselves as an important part of the solution to achieving nutrition for all. It is achievable and we can all play our part in it. So I look forward to the discussions and I want to thank you all for coming here today and thank you for the opportunity of making the presentation. <laughs>
bank. So let's begin with you, um, Dr. Elias. Uh, the Gates Foundation is famously committed to evidence and emerging technologies and innovation. Why does Gates find it compelling about the case for investing in nutrition, and in particular about the case for integrating nutrition into new agricultural investment? Thanks, Kate, and thanks all of you for coming today. Um, I, I get to sing for the choir, I guess, and I make the case for investing in nutrition. I think that's been very well done by both ministers and by your introductory comments and by the interest of all the people who've come today. Um, you know, I think that we've heard about the importance of the first thousand days from conception to the, the first two years of life as an important opportunity to make an investment that captures value for resilient strength for, for cognitively and health-wise for, for children that persist through their childhood and into their adulthood. We know that if we don't do that, we affect their school performance, ultimately their economic productivity, et cetera. Most of the comments that you've heard so far are focused on the investment of that opportunity in, for children. I think it is important to recognize, however, that undernourished women are also at significant risk of their own health in terms of, of being more likely to suffer complications in pregnancy and delivery, and more cause of maternal mortality, postpartum hemorrhage, which can be life-threatening, particularly on the top on top of underlying anemia, et cetera. So, uh, there's not it's an important investment case for this early investment for children that will last through their lifetime, but there's also a very important investment in terms of the health of women. And then, of course, um, undernourished women also are more likely to have preterm birth, and which is another risk factor for children, et cetera. So I, I think the case for investing in nutrition is pretty airtight, and uh, I think it's reflected by the, all the interests in this meeting. Uh, let me focus the rest of my introductory comments more on this linkage between agriculture and nutrition because I think that's the undertapped, underappreciated opportunity for investment. Even at the Gates Foundation, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting our journey. We began with nutrition as an important component of our global health strategy a decade ago. Uh, and as we invested in some of the research and some of the evidence and began to understand better, how nutrition is an underlying risk factor for so many um, health problems, it became important, for, uh, an increasingly important piece of our health strategy, understanding how to reach um, uh, people, how to focus, particularly on the 1,000 days, how to um, uh, ensure nutrition for uh, women of reproductive age, and some of the newer data about how important the preconception phase may be in terms of uh, even before those 1,000 days start. So we've gone through a journey about the importance of nutrition and understanding who's at greatest risk. And we've, uh, we've wound up, you know, in some place, in, the, in some ways in the same place through our, our journey in agricultural development, which we started about six years ago, actually a significantly big program at the Gates Foundation that was initially focused and still largely focused on improving economic productivity um, of smallholder farmers. As we began to understand the smallholder farmer and the perspective of the smallholder farmer, uh, we realized that we were often reaching, trying to reach the same set of beneficiaries. That many smallholder farmers, the majority are women, um, many of them are reproductive age, many of them are among the poorest of the rural poor, and difficult to reach with other nutrition interventions, often not purchasing commercial food and therefore hard to reach through national fortification programs, etc. So this nexus, the, the, the importance of connecting the dots between investments in agricultural development and our investments in nutrition has become an important area of focus for us in linking our nutrition and agricultural programs and in our, our work with a diverse range of partners um, looking, for instance, at the importance of putting more attention to nutrition-sensitive investments into the CADA plans um, as we come up to the 10th anniversary and th to increasingly focus on the opportunity to advance both the health of, uh, of women and children through better nutrition and to improve agricultural productivity, both to earn more income that might be spent on food, to produce more nutritious food on the farm, and to create, you know, ultimately lower prices of food so that people are less, um, more secure uh, in their ability to purchase high quality and, and um, accessible food. So, we can talk more in the next round, but I think the case uh, was made very well by the ministers for investing in nutrition. And I think there's also ex an equally strong case for making these dots, connecting these dots between agriculture and nutrition. Thank you.
Uh, thank you very much. I think that's uh, an excellent introduction and a good segue to um, Dr. Nwanza. Um, you have 30 years of experience. In 35. 35. <laughs> More than 30. Years. That young. Um, he started as a teenager. <laughs> in the agriculture and rural development and the new rice movement, etc. Um, so in your experience and in EFAD's position, what is it about incorporating nutrition into agriculture that is uh, crucial? What is it that has led you to put such emphasis on this? And, um, and what are you learning as you go? Well, thank you, thank you very much. Uh, for EFAD, the, it's not a question of whether you, you emphasize or put emphasis on, on nutrition or not. It's basically it's, uh, part of our of our DNA, since that's what everybody's using. Um, as you know, we focus ex we, we exclusively on smallholder agriculture. We focus on rural areas, rural development, and agriculture is the mainstay and livelihoods of the populations in rural areas. Logically, uh, you couldn't talk about agriculture, uh, rural development without agriculture. We didn't talk about agriculture without nutrition. Uh, and so for us, uh, recognition that uh, on, on the nutrition is out, out, actually has a rural, a rural bias, and, and uh, three, three quarters of undernourished people live in low-income rural areas or developing countries. So for us, it was basically uh, a must. Um, and when you when you look at it, um, IFAD, what we refer to as the agreement establishing IFAD, specifies, and I will quote. The importance of improving the, the nutritional level of the poorest populations in developing countries and the conditions of their lives. And further, on our lending policies and criteria, we say that improving nutritional standards and improvement of diet and income of low-income people should constitute the guiding principle of the funds mandate. These were years before I joined IFA. So for us, it's a must. And now when you look at the picture here, that we are working globally with 500 million small farms, not small farmers, small farm holdings. You're looking at between 2.5, 3 billion people in rural areas whose livelihoods depend on agriculture. That's about half of our, of our population globally. You couldn't ignore this group. So focusing on their agricultural productivity, focusing on their nutritional status is a must. They go hand in hand. So over the years, we have therefore given greater strength and attention to enabling smallholders to increase production and productivity and to access markets and integrate their production into value chains, assuming that improvements in productivity and increases in income will automatically lead to improved nutritional status. And that's what we all did. Let them produce more, produce it better, they will eat better foods. But that was not the case. So something was missing along that link. Today we now know that we have many examples of improved incomes and productivity accompanied by persistent undernutrition and micronutrient malnutrition, which means there has to be a different focus. And what we have done over the years is to build a, 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 a rather robust uh, uh, results measurement framework where we included the impact of reducing, uh, where we included the um, uh, it's a strong cor correlation with women's empowerment. And we found that when we focused on women, on rural women, before you take pride in what I'm going to say, <laughs> rural women, <laughs> we found that when we empower rural women financially, that they focus primarily on the nutrition, education, and health of their children. So empowering, empowering, empowering rural women, giving them access to financial services, making more money, the first thing they want to do is to take care of the family and the community. So when you have a community that is empowered through the women in that community, you are, you are sure not only to have your children go to school, you are sure to have them eat good and nutritious food. And so this has become a focus, a kind of a gender lens for us. We have also developed other impact indicators, for instance, acute, chronic, underweight nutrition and the length of the hungry season. But it's important here to, to emphasize, uh, I wouldn't go into the second question, to, to emphasize that uh, really focusing on nutrition 
agriculture, nutrition related agriculture or agriculture and nutrition is not something that IFAD can do alone. It calls for par partnership. It calls for partnerships and I, I, I really uh, here want to uh, thank the Canadian government for uh, the recent initiative that will actually help us mainstream nutrition into our portfolios in country programs. And I will have discussions with the Gate Foundation. I hope that we will be able to come to some conclusions this year <laughs> uh, to achieve some kind of a PPT, PPP and to really take this forward. Uh, the bottom line for us at IFAD is that it's not whether you produce more food or whether you, you diversify your production. It's basically one program. Agriculture and nutrition go hand in hand. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. So a strong message on the importance of uh, integration. Um, let me turn to uh, Mr. Kandela, Sida. Um, this problem has been with us almost as long as we have been here on planet Earth, but we do see renewed momentum around it now. Um, we heard a very eloquent statement from the minister on why Canada puts priority on this. Would you like to uh, flesh that out at all and speak to why you think we do see this, this great energy around the sun movement and nutrition in general? Um, I think as all many of the speakers have said, investing in nutrition is investing in our future. And even yesterday we spent the day talking about learning for all and it was clear that uh, you need uh, good nutrition for cognitive capacity, but also you can't send a kid with an empty stomach and expect that children, those children to learn. So it's everywhere. And that, that I think is where the difference is now. Canada has been investing in nutrition for decades. Uh, we have a really strong track record in terms of cell thyroidization, vitamin E supplementation. We work with key partners at HKI, the Micronutrient Initiative, UNICEF, and the World Bank, and all of those. Um, but I think what we found uh, in the last few years is we need to put nutrition in more than just our health sectors. And we have put nutrition as part of our uh, food security strategy. We have put nutrition as part of our children and youth strategy. Uh, we are working with organizations like CJIR on bio for education. So we need to look at the whole aspect of nutrition. And we do have an incredible momentum with the sun movement. I think we need to stop and think that only three years ago, April 2010, many people in this room were here. Like uh, at the World Bank, we launched the sun framework. And three years later, uh, we had, so in April, we launched this. At the G8 Canada and the Earth Presidency launched the Muskoka Initiative where nutrition was a key event, a key component. And then in September, Ireland and uh, the US did the Thousand Day event where we all came together in New York to launch this. And uh, there's now 34 Sun countries. And I have to say, every time I, I speak about this, I keep having to ask David Navajo, how many more? Because every time it changed. But there's 34. As of this morning, that was the number. Um, and. Uh, Recently, uh, Tanzania, unfortunately, you can't be with us. Um, they were telling us that they have 208, uh, 280 civil society organizations that are part of the Tanzania Sun Movement. This is incredible. So I, I think we, we have now, we have a business case for why investing in nutrition. We know what are the key intervention that will make a difference. It's based on evidence. We have the platform with Sun, where you bring government, donor, civil society, uh, private sector together. So now what we need is we need to actually integrate it in everything we do. And I think agriculture is a key sector. There's significant investment in agriculture. And if we do it right with agriculture, we'll make significant change in nutrition. All right, thank you. And I want to thank all the speakers, by the way. We're doing very well on time. We appreciate the um, concise replies. Um, Jurgen, uh, for those who don't know the bank structure, I come from the sector that includes health, nutrition, and population. You're from this from agriculture and environmental services. We have nutrition in our name, so we have to do something about it uh, <laughs> in HMP. But in agriculture, this is a vast sector that accounts for the vast majority of poor people in the world. Um, you could fill a whole agenda for years and never get near nutrition, but uh, I know you've put quite a bit of your uh, resources and credibility behind this. So what is it that moves you to do that, and how do you make this case to your colleagues? Well, you've convinced me. <laughs> <laughs> For starters. <laughs> Look, I mean, we're already more than halfway through this hour. Um, I could not possibly make a more eloquent case for why this is important to matter, so I won't try. I think the previous speakers have laid that out very, very clearly. I, I love the, Dr. Novans' comment that it's in the DNA of IFAD. Mm -hmm. 
it isn't in the DNA of the World Bank. And I'm, and I'm thinking about some genetic modification. <laughs> <laughs> which is not popular in every quarter. But we do actually, <laughs> we, I think it's a very, very valid point. You know, we have happily, like he said, plotted along in parallel in our various tribes. And the agricultural tribe was mightily happy producing a lot more food and being very, I think, very successful in it. And sort of paying lip service to, yeah, I'm pretty sure, you know, being intuitive, yes, it's more food, better, higher incomes, etc. So I'm sure we have an impact. And I think it's you, all of you in the room who we've interacted with, who've made the case that it is not true. And I think it's, in, I, I don't know of any other development, um, what do you call it, uh, argument that's so well made. You know, I think you have convinced the top leadership, politically, the technicians, and everybody else around the world that this is where we need to focus. So for me, where I sit, I need to now work with my tribe and get this through the system. And that's the challenge. And I think that's the second round of the conversation. How do we do that? Because that's what it comes down to. I feel that, I mean, I know half the people in this room, and I know you all converted soon. Probably half of you will not even hear anything new in this hour. We need to get out of this space, get into the political environment. Ireland and Canada clearly are leading. For you, this is no brainers. Many others, it's not. From where I work. And I think that's where we need to emphasize. We also need to get the language right. It's still too technical. I'm battling this in my own space on climate change. You know, we had this wonderful event during our recent training where we were, we had a psychologist in the room and he said, look, I've been watching what you're doing in the World Bank on climate change and sustainability. And I'm appalled by the language you're using. <laughs> Is it green? Nobody likes green. <laughs> sustainable? Nobody understands sustainable. You know, so it just went on and on and on. I think that's another very important point. In a political space in the countries that we work, they have to feel it and get it. And they don't in many places where we have to get stronger. But maybe we come to this, how I certainly see driving this through the organization and how we interact with our clients. Thank you, Jürgen. So let's turn to the how-to um, and what it is exactly we need to do. And let me turn back to Dr. Mwanza. Um, based on the EFED's experience, what advice do you have for others about how to approach scaling up of investment in agriculture to maximize outcomes for nutrition as opposed to other things? And how can we ensure that agricultural policies give sufficient attention to the small world of farmers that you so eloquently spoke of? Uh, yeah, for the sake of time, I will be very brief, uh, but I hope that we can take these discussions further in other forum. Um, from our experience, we need a multifaceted approach. And Jürgen, I would say, to sustainably improve agriculture's contribution to nutrition. Um, four main areas, and I will not expand again for the sake of time. One is leadership and advocacy at all levels. And it's got to be at a local, national level. Because too many times I find that the international community is in the, forefront, is in the front, but the government should take responsibility for this. I think we need to work on advocacy at national levels, at all levels. National, it is, it, is, it is very important that the national governments themselves take leadership and show commitment, both political and where possible financial, no matter how small it is. Number two is to mainstream perspectives and build institutional capacity. At least in the agricultural sector, when you talk to national agricultural uh, personnel or staff and ministries or in, uh, agricultural institutions, nutrition is considered a health issue. So we have to build national, national capacity in the agricultural sector on nutrition. And that's the only way they can mainstream it. It's not enough for us to give five, five million, ten million dollars to the national, to the, to the Ministry of Agriculture and tell them to mainstream nutrition into their programs. They cannot because they don't have the capacity. So we have to build that capacity. Number three is to better identify and address knowledge gaps. Where are the knowledge gaps? I think some, someone, one of them, uh, our, our host mentioned that. And finally, as I said earlier, partnerships. We've got to build partnerships. Partnerships with the public sector, with the private sector, and foremost, partnership with the farmer himself or herself. And most farmers in developing countries are women. They've got to be part of the partnership. At the bottom-up 
uh, a bottom-up approach is very important. And I think amongst uh, specific uh, examples on the ground interventions, I can list them, increasing incomes to improve the ability of farmers to, put, to produce, to, uh, to, to purchase food. <coughs> As I said, it's not enough for them to increase production and productivity, but it's good if they're able to produce enough to sell, enough to feed themselves and to sell, so they can use that money to buy what they cannot produce, more nutritious, uh, diversified vegetable <coughs> products. We have to strengthen local food systems, including storage and food processing. We have to focus on household livelihood strategies and decision making. We have to focus on gender and time use. We found that women, rural women, will go for time-saving technologies not so much as increasing yield, because they save time to do other things, while the men, of course, have different preferences. So time-saving technologies and to, for, 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 uh, to, to devote to other things. And of course, incorporating nutrition education into demand-driven extension services. This refers to the first thing I said. And then, of course, working in partnership across sectors with particular attention to education, to health, and for girls and women. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Um, Jurgen, turning back to you, um, a bit of the how-to. Um, how are we in the bank supporting the Sun Movement call for nutrition-sensitive programming in agriculture? And as you develop the Agricultural Action Plan, once we've overcome the language, have you found situations where we've been able to do policy and practice that focuses on enhancing nutrition as well as maximizing yields and other sector outcomes? I mean, we do fully support the Sun Movement. We've created the platform, the platform and we are an active <coughs> member in it. I think we in, internally are reaching out across the institution and externally we're getting more and more partners in to share knowledge to understand what works, what doesn't work and how we, how we take it forward. Um, for me internally, we've just <coughs> done the second agricultural action plan update, which is following our strategy, which had nutrition in it initially but wasn't the main focus. In the second update, which will be printed, I believe, next week, so it will be available to all of you, you will see a tremendous change in the way we approach this. This is not a, sec a section or a paragraph or an add-on. It permeates the narrative. Just like the first one, where gender permeated the narrative. Now, we, we managed within this organization over a three-year period to go from very little to 100% pretty much gender-informed design, analysis, and monitoring. <coughs> not quite there yet, but we're almost there, over a period of three years. My intention is to do the same with nutrition. We're not there today, but I, in, in two to three years from now, we will be there. Everyone who goes out as a World Bank class team leader, with a team, interacting with the government around anything that sounds like agricultural development, broadly, will ask a number of questions. They will ask themselves, and they will ask the client. What is it that we can do to have more nutrition-sensitive outcomes? Fundamentally, that's the question to ask, and how do we do that? And of course, there are a number of things, and again, can I relate it out extremely well, so I don't need to repeat it, I and mean, we often, we read each other's stuff, too. And we, and we collaborate <laughs> on, on these things, and, and I couldn't agree more. I mean, it's, you've got to focus on women. Create more time, get the income to women, because they make better choices when they have the farm income, etc. So I don't want to repeat I mean, it's, it's, it's very clear, so we see completely eye to eye in this agenda. In, in our sector board, the way we are organized, you know, we have 250 people who work in agriculture in the practice in the World Bank, and they are represented by managers in the various regions, and I meet those managers at least twice a month. And we have, on a regular basis, a conversation around how are you doing with your teams in moving as the pipeline rolls out for the next three years, you know, how are you doing in nutrition-sensitive outcomes? And you will see a significant change going forward, not every project, not every place, but a lot, it's not going to be coincidence. It's not going to be unintentional outcomes. It will be a much more deliberate effort. Um, on, on another front, um, the minister mentioned the contribution to GAFS, the Global Agriculture Food Security Program. It's a hugely important part of what we do. Very successful, and very interestingly, this is probably the least supply-driven instrument that we have, where we really build on what countries want from the donors through the CADAP processes, and everything else, and lo and behold, over half of those projects that have been funded have nutritional components in them and have nutritional outcomes. 
took us a bit by surprise too, because it actually was not driven top down. It actually came bottom up. This is probably the least donor influenced uh, interaction that we have. And the Sun uh, report that sort of reviewed some of these things makes made special mention of six projects, um, you know, and that they did extremely well. My, my expectation, yeah, I'm, a, I'm a little hesitant to sort of say, let's use GAFs, the instrument, to drive nutrition downwards. I'm much more interested in having the conversations in the countries that are the clients, so that they ask for the right programs that we then can finance. So I think that dynamic, we need to maintain the integrity of the instrument, but lo and behold, it's actually happening. And, and so we, we will close that feedback. Those are the two sort of, from where I sit, probably most interesting um, developments. Very good. But I think, uh, if I may, this is one of the recurring themes in these spring meetings, is how much is being country-led and driven now. The era of the donor-driven development model is rapidly um, moving behind us, which is a welcome development, because ultimately everything is country-driven, of course. So, um, Dr. Elias, can you um, give us your thoughts? Any particular examples you'd like to cite of successful country-level experiences that have effectively integrated nutrition? Um, and if so, or even if not, um, are there particular gaps that you think need to be highlighted and what more can we do on the development partner side to increase incentives for this? Thanks. Uh, I think that, you know, there's a growing, as, as the panelists have said, there's growing recognition that there's a huge opportunity here. It's been, um, it hasn't been fully captured yet. And so I think what we're beginning to see kind of some shifts in perspective to go beyond sort of monocular focus on on how we measure our success to go beyond just kind of yield per acre. And it's one of my colleagues to say, we have to figure out how to measure nutrition per acre for our agriculture uh, de development investments. We don't quite know how to do that yet, but um, those are the kinds of questions we need to be asking ourselves. And as we think about um, what the solutions and where the investments are, I think we basically have to understand that we have to think across the entire value chain. That something as complex as nutrition and agricultural food systems is not likely to be solved by a magic bullet in one place or another. So we really have to look all across the value chain, where can we make interventions? And I think if, as we do that, we're seeing important successes. So beginning you know, upstream in terms of the inputs, the seeds, you know, <coughs> important innovations coming out of biofortification, um, uh, important, uh, you know, uh, in, uh, involvement of farmers, particularly smallholder farmers, through the you know participatory uh, bar varietal selection, combined with the nutrition education that I was talking about, to, to highlight the importance <coughs> of, of nutrition in some of those decisions that farmers have to make about what to plant, etc. I was, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, our Tanzanian colleagues aren't here. I was a couple of. Uh, uh, weeks ago, um, uh, well, a couple of months ago in Tanzania, I had an opportunity to visit some projects there, and then a couple of weeks ago in Ethiopia, where I uh, visited uh, the Malkasa Agricultural Research Center, where they had done some breeding where they had a couple of uh, varieties of beans that had significantly higher iron and, and zinc content, um, but weren't being adopted very much because, and I asked why, and they said, well, because they don't look right, they don't have exactly the same color. Uh, and I could barely see the difference. So understanding more, uh, rather than you know, sort of a top-down, here's what's good for you, we have to understand how farmers are making decisions about the varieties they choose, bring, incorporate the nutritional education into that um, uh, through a more extensive extension system, et cetera, to, to basically work across, again, the value chain, to look importantly at some of the issues around storage and, and, and uh, post-harvest losses. Uh, an important area that we've made some strategic investments in is, is understanding the tremendous damage done by aflatoxin and other mycotoxins and because of poor um, storage and, uh, and, and market access and long-time uh, spoilage of, of crops, et cetera. I think, though, in the short term, we have some very immediate opportunities through the policy process and through strengthening uh, the next round of things like the the the, uh, the global um, agricultural food security program, and um, yeah, well, it's great that half of over half of the uh, projects approved to date have nutrition sensitive agriculture. I do think we can encourage more. Um, I think we can be more active, and I, I think Jurgen's right that that'll be primarily through make, increasing the awareness of the opportunity. Um, uh, I think that the gaps is a, is an under. Uh, 
uh, underutilized uh, instrument for supporting some of these nutrition sensitive agricultural interventions. Perhaps our most immediate, though, is through the, the process with the Comprehensive African Agricultural Development Program, the CADAP plans. Um, NEPAD has convened two regional meetings already in Dakar and, an, and another one earlier this year in Dar es Salaam. There'll be a, a third one later this year in Johannesburg, um, looking at how we can really encourage uh, countries or how countries can take, care, take advantage of the opportunity of putting more nutrition sensitive components into their CADAP plans. We're coming up on the 10th anniversary of the Maputo commitments. This coming year is the African, uh, the year of African agriculture. The African Union is going to be highlighting this at, as part of their 50th anniversary celebration. I really think there is an opportunity by supporting the CATA process, really, which was an African-led mm -hmm. process, um, to strengthen these CATA plans together with the Sun plans. Um, as a uh, bringing together those national country-led processes to provide really the opportunity for the donor community to understand what are the tremendous opportunities in particular countries because given the differences in agroecology and crops etc these will be very local solutions as as agriculture often is but informed with a nutrition lens and with some of the other investments we've been making in getting better data understanding um, because it is so uh, different, different climate zones and different crops, we need to understand, oftentimes at the subnational level, but certainly uh, through these national plans, the opportunities for the development partners globally to make investments that advance both agricultural productivity and improve nutrition. Thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, Diane, we're running a bit short on time, but in a minute or two, could you tell us from Canada's uh, viewpoint, your long experience in this, um, what you feel we call development partners can do to promote more nutrition sensitive agriculture? Okay. I think we, uh, we all said, we all know that resources are limited. So I think for me that there's really four things that, or well, some to four things that we can do uh, as donors. Better use the existing resources. Make our existing investment go uh, further, use all of the platforms that we sit on, all of these multilateral meetings that we attend, whether they're on other topics, whether they're with different institutions, to bring the same message. Uh, make sure that nutrition consideration is included. The second thing, and to be along on what you said, Chris, is that we need to support uh, our development partners implement their own programs. We can't design it ourselves, it has to be owned by them, we need to support them. We can't impose one more thing on them. So we need to work with them. Um, the third one I would say is we need to be there for the long run. This cannot be the flavor of the day. You know, it's a long-term investment, and as you were saying, Keith, Keith, it's one thing that if we do it now, we don't have to redo it again, but we need to keep at it until we, we've succeeded. And I guess the fourth thing I would say is we need to hold ourselves to account. We need to be accountable. Um, so we look forward to coming back in two, three years to see, you know, if it's part of your DNA. Uh, and we need, as donors, to deliver on what we pledge. If we make a commitment, we need to deliver. All right. Thank you. Um, we will have to stop here, but this is obviously just meant to whet the appetites of those of you who have more interest in this and give a bit more information to those of you who are already informed. The conversation will continue. We will be continuing this um, on the bank side as well. Um, and it's clear we've heard a very strong case, not just for investing in nutrition, but for investing in agriculture for nutrition, uh, which was the key point of this panel. Um, it's been an honor to have um, colleagues here from our siblings in the UN system from the Gates Foundation, and we had hoped to have Tanzania as well, but they are here in spirit. Um, and I think what's clear is there's already some very encouraging innovation going on. There's leadership at the country level. There is great buy-in from the international partner level. Um, the tribes within the bank and in the world at large are speaking together more than ever before. And I think there's renewed energy around this. I can certainly commit my part of the World Bank to this agenda, as we have been all along. Um, and I think it's just of uh, growing um, importance to all of us to, to redouble our efforts as we come down to the last thousand days before uh, the MDGs are due. And of course, well beyond that as well. This really needs to be at the core um, of our our development goals in the future. Um, I want to close again by really thanking um, uh, more than our co-hosts, Canada and Ireland. It was really at their instigation that we got this going uh, in the first place. Um, they have both been stalwart champions, as I mentioned, in the world at large and in the World Bank. 
Um, in the World Bank, we like to be loved for more than just our money, and we try to emphasize our uh, convening influence, and spring meetings are an outstanding opportunity to do this, because there are people here from so many different organizations um, and sectors, and this is an excellent chance to bring people together in dialogue. And without our colleagues in this particular ED's office from Canada and Ireland, and without those governments, we may not all be here today. So thank them very much. Thank all of you for participating, and we look forward to working with all of you as we go forward. Have a good afternoon.